Courtyard by Marriott presents CNBC TV 18 Disruptors. Welcome, you're watching a brand new edition of the Disruptors on CNBC TV 18. Who are the Disruptors? Disruptors are a bunch of Davids who cause shivers down the spines of many a Goliath. They make the scene by breaking the status quo and toppling the apple cart. We tell you stories of many such who've not only redefined the rules, but redefined the game itself. Here's one such. There are two ways at looking at breakfast. One, it could be a celebration of the fact that you've got another day to live. Second, it could be providing nutrition for the day that you have to live. Before we do and track the story of India's cereal killers, let's take a look at what's inside India's breakfast cereal bowl. Mr. Sham Bagri grew up in Nokha in Rajasthan. After joining the family business of flour milling, which was a group of 16 flour mills across the country at the age of 19, he aspired to set up a mill on his own. In the 1980s, he focused on the flour mills he had established and built a strong institutional business with clients such as Nestle, GSK, Britannia, Domino's Pizza, Modern Foods, to name a few. He then came across oats, which was a seemingly western grain with excellent nutritive properties. In 1992, he built a small oat mill in India. He started selling oats under the brand of Oatex. He then developed a Swiss breakfast cereal, Muesli, in India for the first time in 1994. And here's the story of India's breakfast cereal disruptors, the incumbent killers, the Bagarins. They are the owners, the founders and the disruptors of breakfast cereal, the Bagris. We have with us Aditya and Shamji. Thank you so much for joining us on the disruptors. Before we start, uh, you know, talking about your business, the thing that intrigued me the most was your surname is spelled B-A-G-R-I, Bagri. And you anglicized it, called it Bagri's. Why was that? So we have not done that, to be very frank. So Bagri, one problem was IP problem because it's a surname, so you can't get that IP, you know. So to be very frank, we never thought about this, that it will uh, sound like a very foreign kind of brand. All right. know? So from that angle, our designer, he designed this brand and we loved it. And then we started with this brand. And that was... So it was the IP problem and you didn't really go no, out to... No, 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 frankly no. You've been a disruptor. You come from a family of flour millers. You had 16 flour mills in your family. But you disrupted that, went to Delhi and made a plant with the spares of those 16 plants and made it very profitable, the most profitable. Yeah, in 1979, 80, we started Delhi unit. We had initial lot of problem in running the mill, but somehow or other after fixing all the issues in the plant and renovating the plant or making it uh, functional. And in first year of operation, it was like profitable and we had a good profit in that unit in 1980. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'd like to share a small thing with you that in flour mill, you have a roller, flour, a roller mills which grind the flour, uh, wheat. Right. So one of the roller mill was not working properly. Okay. You have to engage it. Right. So it was not engaging properly. So what we did, we used a truck jack Okay. To keep it frugal innovation at best. <laughs> so we did with that, you know. So what took you then to Muesli? So in early 90s, what, we, what I did that, I always was very keen to have my products in the self. And flour mill is a B2B business. It's like selling flour to the... So that time you were supplying to Nestle, GSK and all of them? That time, yeah, Britannia, uh, all those modern bay. And modern you still supply to them? 
yeah, it's still supply to them. We have a flour mill in Rajasthan, so from there. So we, all the oats that we have in the Britannia oat cookies yeah, and yeah, yeah, all yeah. the oats that we have in the Nestle oats Maggie's, yeah, yeah, as we supply well as GSK, all of that are yes. supplied by you. Yeah, we do a lot of R and D with them to develop these products. Like it's not just the supply, but it's also you know reaching a point where they can innovate and create some products with oats. So it's one of those B two B turning into B two C products. So that time right? oat was not that. That time it was wheat flour. So in 1990, first thing I did was with a wheat. Uh, sorry, wheat bran. Wheat bran is a byproduct in a flour mill. It's used for cattle feed. So we process the wheat bran in such a way that it become a very good product for human consumption. And it's a very healthy, very high in dietary fiber, very high in protein. So at what point did you think that muesli is a product that will work? Because Indians, you know, from pre-British era have been eating a lot of cornflakes and traditionally a cornflake eating nation which is eating cereals actually we're traditionally an upma poha idli etc eating nation for cereals it would only be cornflakes at that point what made you think that you know muesli could be the disruptor see after uh, wheat bran we came into oats and mm -hmm. oat is the main ingredient for muesli so that is a value addition in the oats so we thought that if you want to incorporate oat in your diet muesli is the best way and tastier way and healthier way to incorporate. Muesli is no added fat. So we made o uh, muesli with very high percentage of oats. And still our muesli has the highest percentage of oats in the category. In the 1900s, Swiss physician Maximilian Bircher Benner found a strange dish that was served to him and his wife on a hike in the Swiss Alps. The word muesli is a Swiss German variation of the German word muse, meaning porridge, and the diminutive suffix li. The recipe consisted of oat flakes, raw apples, condensed milk, nuts and lemon juice and it led Dr. Bircher Benner to overwhelming improvements in the health of many of his patients. Muesli in its modern form became popular in the western countries starting in the 1960s as part of increased interest in health food and vegetarian diets. I came to know Muesli through a book called Alternative Therapies or something like that. You know, the small books used to have that time. So in, in one of the things, the Muesli was given and how it is healthy and how it is made. So I picked up something. And there. that wasn't popular until Bill Clinton ate it in India? Yeah, no, no. Uh, Mr. President Clinton came early 2000 um, and he came as a president and that time Muesli was not very popular in India and we were supplying to ITC, Moria Sheraton. So we got a special order of supplying them because it was uh, like security. Was there any citation that you got from? We got a letter from uh, the, distributor the distributors and the secret service came to our factory okay. to check out like, you know, and pick up a bunch of cases they bought. So because it has to be tested before it's served to the president. So that was very exciting, especially for us as kids. The United States had ignored India for over two decades, but a new chapter in bilateral ties opened in 2000 when the then president Bill Clinton visited the country. It was a matter of pride for Bagri's when the muesli served to Bill Clinton and his family came from the house of Bagri's. The other interesting part was so I keep asking him, you know, how did you, uh, you know, come across Bran? So he keeps telling me that when he was like a teenager, he used to read up on books of Mahatma Gandhi and his inspirational mm -hmm. quotes. And out there, there was an excerpt on the health ban benefits of brand and, and the fact that choker is really good for you. Mm -hmm. So from there, he's like, you know, I'll do something with choker. So that was always, you know, at the back of his mind. So, you know, we're re really glad that now each and every product which we make in some way or another has a high fiber brand component. And that sort of carried on from, you know, a Gandhian inspiration. It was challenging, right? Because I was looking through your financials one crore in around 1989 that turned into just two crore up to the end of the millennium and then after that you saw that growth so uh, muesli didn't really pick up right i think that time it was not um, you know built from a financial perspective so in, back in the early 90s that had a bit of you know when we started this entity which which we operate bagri's india we had a bit of you know b2b milling activities so that's what was reflecting the top line but what was most exciting, and I'd see my parents, you know, at work, and my father was very passionate about what he made. So for him, the exciting part was that, you know, he's putting something of his own on the shelf. And even some people in our office were, you know, very curious because they're like, here's a guy who has a milling business where he crushes thousands of tons of wheat, and he's getting excited about putting small packets of a byproduct, 
ये तो हम फेंक देते हैं यू नो यूटिंग दैट वी प्रोसेसिंग दैट इन पुटिंग दैट ऑन द शेल्फ एंड देन ही गॉट इन टू न्यूज प्लीज एंड आई कीप यू नो आस्किंग हाउ डिड यू मैनेज टू कम अक्रॉस इट बिकॉज देर इज नो इंटरनेट देर इज नो यू नो वे टू एक्टली रिसर्च सच फूड बट वी सम मैनेज इन द एक्साइटमेंट वॉज मोर टू बिल्ड इट आउट ऑफ पैशन ड्यूरिंग दैट टाइम वी इवन एक्सपेरिमेंटेड विद ग्रनोला बाज वी प्रॉब्ली द फर्स्ट टू लॉन्च इट इन द नाइनटीज इन ब्राउन राइस कैटेगरीज विच नो आर पॉपुलर नाउ Interesting, great product, great disruption. But where there is disruption, there is always competition, and there was the incumbent which was disrupted. you were talking about initial challenges and how you know it was difficult to get people to accept that product but then there was that huge incumbent kellogs how did you manage to you know hold your own against cornflakes and cornflakes you is a is a product that you kept trying we started with muesli oats and bran cornflakes right from the initial uh, start i was not very keen to start the cornflakes because cornflakes doesn't have fiber but with the market pressure we started conflex maida and suji in 2003 4 after running it for about 6 months to 1 year one day we decided that since it's diagonally opposite conflex hardly any fiber so let's stop it and let's not do it but there was a lot of market pressure because conflex is the most common breakfast cereal so what we did we developed a conflex with wheat bran so we put it on the shelf when the customer used to eat when is today at at the milk so bran is to separate so that was a problem so we we drew that product then we made conflicts with oats that also didn't click but in around 3 years back in 15 16 after doing lot of uh, like research and all we mixed two dietary fibers in the conflicts in the process do you think all of this really matters to the customer because a customer thinks cereal or of cereal as cereal you go to the store you see eight different brands you do not uh, most of the customers i personally cannot differentiate between a muesli and a note and a rice bran or a wheat bran or whatever it is i just go it is a packet which has to be put into the milk and you consume it do you think it really matters you know if if you look at india as a heterogeneous market so mm-hmm. if you look at it in a broader way then you know what you what you're indicating is uh, you know very important that breakfast cereals is you know viewed largely as one big you know category of something you blend with milk and have it instantly in the morning and it's considered considered very western but once you break it down and especially if you look at some of the audiences which are you know increasingly more relevant for us mm-hmm. which are millennials and and the organized retail market or the ones that use e-commerce they are getting increasingly more particular about what they eat and you know what goes into their products so i would say that if it did not matter 10 years ago at all it's becoming increasingly more relevant now uh, the ingredients that we make uh, you know the the products the ethos uh, the values of a brand are getting more and more important it's as important to know you know what we do and what we won't do in terms of you know making responsible products and if we see the global trend so so even categories like oats and and muesli mm-hmm. and and healthier breakfast options are growing in the west mm-hmm. which is a very saturated market and and they're growing increasingly and the sugary the unhealthy versions are coming down so a lot of the incumbent incumbent players in the west are actually under pressure because of this transition so you've got you know new disruptive categories happening but in india the overall uh, consumption of packaged foods is also very low i i'll take off from the point that you made that incumbents are also compelled to make healthier options in that case where does bhagri's positioning lie because you guys are disruptors but the brand bhagri is yeah. versus brand kellogs or now brand nestle when the incumbent comes out with a healthier option the customer usually chooses to go to the incumbent rather than the disruptor how do you manage that shift so i think manglam the entire idea is that as a brand you know there's a lot of trust in world so when when we speak to our customers i see that there's a lot of trust and there's no, it's not just uh, you know a very transactional relationship that our customers have it's it's more driven by values years of consumption and and a sort of trust so when we decided to put conflicts off the shelf in 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 2000s uh, early 2000s it was more you know based on the trust that we won't do something vanilla which is not good for our consumers because they already believe in us and um, and that 
that's what we've inca inculcated in the brand. So each and every product that Basbees makes has to be honestly healthy, nutritionally extremely well balanced, nothing artificial inside but it. That's you telling me, I see none of your advertising because I was reading, you said when you started out you were so small that you had to piggyback on the Kellogg's advertising to grow the category and then you, you know, found your little niche out there. So are you guys increasing your advertisements now and making a brand itself out of Bagri's? I think on the communication front, right, uh, we are very cognizant of the fact that you cannot have a copy-paste approach of, you know, what's happening in the category if you want to actually be disruptive as a player. You can't, you know, target new consumers in the same way, which is, you know, very classical that go do a mainstream blitzrig blit of, you know, mass media. So we run very, you know, um, regional, very uh, focused campaigns. We've had a few national mass media campaigns, but the larger focus is increasingly getting on consumer trials. So, you know, we have a strong belief that if you try an honest product, invariably you will come back to it. And does that reflect in your numbers? Last year you had 18.7% market share as against almost 60% for Kellogg's. Has that shifted a little bit? So that's, you know, so that's, uh, that's moved a bit. Uh, honestly, what's happened is that we've always stayed in the niche, right? So if you look at the market, we've been very strong in the niches that, you know, we've worked on, which are oats and newsly. Um, we've recently entered into uh, the cornflake segment as a value added player. So it's not just, you know, vanilla products and and we're gaining share there so and you're not worried about Quaker or Safola or any of those guys coming out with their masala oats or the plain vanilla oats or even Nestle which is eyeing the breakfast space so so bad so not really actually because you know as a homegrown Im incumbent player right there's so much more opportunity every outlet we add we're actually creating a newer market for ourselves right so there's huge opportunity you know ahead of us in terms of where we can reach also we realize that this philosophy of honest health and nutrition there's a lot to do so we were in Oats and Muesli brand and we had, you know, uh, brand in a niche. Now we, are a, uh, we have got a vision that we want to be a total health foods company. Okay. So we are getting into the healthy snacking space with flavored makanas or a genuine organics range with very responsible organic superfoods of quinoa and chia. So we want to be there where our customers are, um, you know, when they think of health and nutrition. So provide, you know, all innovative products which can cater to modern nutritional needs. So it's a far wider vision than just breakfast cereals. Let's talk about pricing that is important you have an incumbent which was always at a premium pricing or the pricing that it was at anyone else who wanted a share from there would have had to discount their pricing yeah. in that case how do you see bagries because i speak to a few customers they see your product as a bridge to go on to the next product which is an incumbent brand they would say okay uh, bagries does oats and muesli let's get that the day kellogg's and nestle start doing it we'll go to that um, how do you protect your share from that? Very interesting question, Manglam, and you know it's one of those most uh, you know hotly debated subjects in in any office. I'd say in any FMCG, pricing's always had you know a traditional trade-off between you know creating brand versus versus trying to you know get immediate sales. And I feel um, the way we look at pricing's. Um, you know, very holistic. So one is that the categories that we've been incumbent in, like muesli and oats, from an MRP perspective, we're at par or a little higher than most of our, you know, esteemed competition. And I feel that's very important. And, and the insight, at least what, you know, we've got with consumer research is that our consumers are not having our muesli because it's cheaper, because it's a very differentiated product. Mm. Uh, they're having it because they want to have it. You know, it's a product that they relate to, it resonates with their lifestyle. And I think that's a very important distinction. So our approach towards product development will be more value added. The other aspect is that uh, obviously um, the ecosystem that we are retailing out of is changing. You have you know e-commerce and organized retail where uh, you have festivals of discounting happening and there's you know a lot of in-channel competition between those channels. So that is what so, I wanted your thoughts on actually. You know you're talking about uh, modern trade and e-commerce where there is a lot of discounting that takes place. So a lot of these discounts actually make your product seem like a cheaper alternative to the incumbent. In that case, uh, how do you manage to bridge this gap of what the company is trying to say and what the customer is actually receiving? The major discounting we have done in the Conflex recently, because we are the new, new brand in the Conflex category, to try our Conflex, this is the better way of doing it. Right now, we want the people to try our product and the product is, though it is much healthier than what the other cornflakes are and we are cornflakes plus, we are not cornflakes. So that is the strategy we have initially taken. So cornflakes we have discounted and like muesli and all, we do that offers and all, time to time when there, were, there are fest, I mean these festival offers and all. 
but our price of yeah. muesli is slightly higher than and even the oats is higher than uh, than the other uh, brands in the market so i believe what you know my father also mentioned is that discounting is a very effective tool to generate trials and i think our approach also is that how do you split that between uh, platforms if you go to let's say um, a kirana store you you may not get the same level of discounting as you would get in an organized retail also it's important to note that discounting actually happens during specific periods right. so when you want to generate trials and you even see that that even um, on platforms like amazon or or let's say you know major retail platforms on on the grocery side um, there would be a specific period when you'd have mega discounts on on specific sqs so it's a huge way of generating trials and footfalls for Good which is your favorite bag based product frenchy muesli yours mine is the recent favorite is our protein muesli because it's india's first whey protein based breakfast cereal and you know it's a product that i've worked very closely on developing so so frenchy and muesli we there's brand. a lot of muesli that you all eat while trials and all of that Who, yeah. who's the last word <laughs> the consumer <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one and uh, finally what's next when we look at the future we are very excited about the opportunity i've been here um, you're not scared of incumbents uh, trying to wrest market share not really because you know market share is a very zero sum sounding term right in india packaged foods consumptions right now are 10% so everyone's eyeing the big opportunity that what happens when a developing country like india starts consuming more packaged food so as you know uh, a food processing industry at large we're all looking at that big opportunity so uh, so we are growing from just a niche boutique you know oats and muesli brand to a complete breakfast brand and then you know beyond into other healthy foods we've also got another um, you know value brand called lawrence mills which is high quality affordable price point which you know helps us penetrate further so there's a huge opportunity in terms of products once you have a distribution network and a brand that you can you know push forward and the most important thing is the philosophy of you know what you will do and what you can't do so and uh, no one looking to buy you out <laughs> so I think so you know as an observer even before I joined the business uh, I believe my father has created a business which which is on you know very strong values and I think values are the most important thing for any brand and uh, when I talk to consumers or you know when I talk to the larger ecosystem many people um, whom we interact with end up consuming our products so it's it's a lot of it's a very positive attribute that they show so there have been feelers that have been coming over the years uh, we've not um, you know engage in any of those conversations seriously because we have a road map ahead which i feel is you know great to build the feelers were from incumbents or any person who wanted to enter the space why are you all i think it's been a mix of you know people uh, at large in financial institutions and all of those um, it's been it's it's a very exciting category and i think no, that that no need be for there. a while i mean for many years but you know i think the market is you've been very passionate about your business you're not selling it to anyone and, and and it's huge market in india now e-commerce is helping we are doing about 10% plus of our turnover from and the market's doing just 5% so you're definitely you're getting really traction yes. it's very interesting right e-commerce as a platform is again a great consumer trial experience and you once you start looking at the data you get uh, you know orders from areas that you don't traditionally expect because you know they're looking out for healthier alternatives and a lot of our products are actually you know um organically becoming best sellers on these platforms because if you make a great product and it's it becomes discovered by e-commerce there is a virality element is there a way for element. you to measure that these are products which are best sellers because they're seeing repeat product uh, pr- uh, purchases or is it the trial so uh, one um, pricing the repeat purchases and the trial pricing and 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 then you get tagged because there's also a lot of customer review happening so when you open you get a rating for a product and many of our products for example on platforms like amazon will have a 4 plus star mm-hmm. rating with great you know consumer reviews coming in so technology itself is disrupting and exactly. helping you disrupt the scene yes so if you honestly make a sincere product today then you have a channel where you can actually talk about it and have others talk about it and endorse it which did not exist you know in an, in a very organized you know, manner this is a very digital uh, time is a very uh, i mean you know i mean it really helps if you have a genuine between product. the two of you all i have to ask this question before i leave which of you all will be the first person to suggest that let's go for an ipo <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I think we have these, um, you know, strategic conversations beyond uh, office hours, in, okay. in, in, and and it's very interesting. So over a bowl of muesli. Over a bowl of muesli. So if it's if it's later the night, then he'll invariably sit down with a bowl of muesli because if you're feeling hungry post dinner, then that's his, you know. During afternoon tea time, muesli is. Put then. on CNBC TV 18 and say, <laughs> wish I was on that ticker out yeah. there. No, you want to be listed. What we're very clear about, to be honest, is that we have a journey ahead. We want to go from being a well. Um, you know, a respected family-run business to an institution. And I think that's the more important part, part of the journey. Along that journey, if we decide, you know, to take it public or, or, or build something further as we achieve scale, I, I feel uh, that'll just be a natural progression. But at this juncture, we're extremely focused on what we're doing and what we want to build out. See, well, uh, frankly speaking, um, I discussed with him, I told him everything. What are the pros and cons of being a private or an investor in, on the board or a listed company? What are the plus minus? So now he has to take a call. I am comfortable with every situation. Over the years, the Bagaris have expanded the brand's retail footprint across the country and internationally as well. They have a capacity of producing almost 180 to 200 tons per month and are considering capacity expansion. Bagaris today sells in over 70,000 retail outlets in India across various channels also sells internationally in Nepal, Bhutan and Bangladesh. It is a market leader in a fast-growing category such as Muesli and India's second largest cereal maker with almost 19% market share. So you have what, 180 crores of revenue right now? Uh, we should be this we year. We should be this year. With God's grace, we should be touching 180 this year. 500 goes when? Hopefully soon, and and I think if we keep on working with the same amount of passion that you know we're putting in our products, then then it'll be something where you'll cross that milestone and it'll happen, you know, in its in its own uh, natural sense instead of trying to just drive revenues and not build the larger consumer base. All right. So on that note, I wish you good luck. Whenever you. you cross that 500 crore mark, somewhere I will be celebrating with my glass of parfait. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Mangalam. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that, ladies and gentlemen, was the exciting story of the serial killers of India, the Bagris. But you stay tuned to CNBC TV 18. Keep it with the disruptors. Another week, another disruptor coming your way. For now, it's me and my breakfast. Courtyard by Marriott presents CNBC TV 18 Disruptors.